In this video, we're going to look at the trigonometric functions of cosecant, secant, tangent, cotangent. For the pi over 6, pi over 4, pi over 3 multiples, or 30, 45, 60 multiples, we're going to use reference angles to evaluate the secant, cosecant, tangent, and cotangent. We're going to use properties of odd and even trigonometric functions. We're going to recognize and use the fundamental identities. And lastly, we're going to be able to evaluate the trigonometric functions with our calculator. Now, if we look at our calculator, most calculators do not have the secant, cosecant, and cotangent buttons, but they do have tangent, cosine, and sine. So we're going to learn how to use those buttons to get the ones that we really want with our calculator. So once again, we're going to start by building a circle centered at the origin. Then, of course, when we are looking at the distance from the center, to some point on the circumference of the circle, we call that r. So x squared is equal to, or r squared, excuse me, r squared is equal to x squared plus y squared all day long still. The angle of rotation is from the positive x axis. My terminal side will be wherever r is. Again, r is being built from the center to some point on the circumference of the circle. We will define the tangent as the ratio of my y value over my x value, so I don't even need the r value. We will define the cotangent, which is the reciprocal of tangent, as the angle in standard position as the ratio of the y value over the x value. If we define cotangent as the reciprocal, in other words, 1 over the tangent of, of my angle, which is equal to 1 over y divided by x, which then becomes x over y. We will do the so same thing for secant and cosecant, we will define the secant as a reciprocal of cosine. So if cosine is y or is x over r, then secant must be r over x. And cosecant as a reciprocal of sine, so cosecant, which is a reciprocal of sine, must be r over y. If we are given the sine of some angle, and it's given to me as a ratio, unless they're asking me for the angle and they're not, they're really asking me for the ratio. They're asking me for cosecant. Now, cosecant is the reciprocal of sine. So this is the same thing as 1 over sine of alpha. So in other words, the cosecant of alpha is going to be the reciprocal of the ratio for sine. So this is going to be negative 7 over 1. I didn't have to do any work there. However, if I'm asked to find the tangent of alpha and I'm given the ratio for cosine, then I do need to find my y because the tangent of alpha is the ratio of y over x. And if I have the cosine, if the cosine of alpha is given to me negative 1 over 7, then that tells me that my x is equal to negative 1, my r is equal to 7, and I need y because that's the ratio for tangent is y over x. So once again, I use x squared plus y squared is equal to r squared all day long. So my y squared must be equal to my r squared, which is 7 squared, minus my negative 1, the quantity squared. So this tells me that y squared is going to be 49 minus 1, so 48. Now I'm chasing y, not y squared. So y is equal to plus and minus the square root of 48. I need to go back over here and determine whether or not I choose the positive or negative. Because it's my angle that I'm looking for is in the second quadrant, which is alpha is larger than pi over 2 but less than pi. That means I'm in quadrant number 2. Now remember in quadrant number 2, y has a positive value, so it'll be the positive, not the negative. So the tangent of my angle is the ratio, and I'm chasing the ratio, not the angle. It's going to be the square root of 48. Well, Let's see if we can uh, clean this up just a little bit. What I mean by that is the square root of 48 is uh, 4 uh, multiplied by 12, so it's 16 multiplied by 3. So the square root of 48 is the square root of 16 times the square root of 3. So in other words, it is 4 root 3. So this is 4 the square root of 3 over my x value. My x value, again, was negative 1, so it's negative 1. So my final answer is negative 4 the square root of 3. And that is my final answer. Just like over here, this is my final answer. 
if I have the tangent of alpha in quadrant number three, and this should be positive when we're in quadrant number three, if the tangent of alpha is a positive three-fourths in quadrant number three, find the secant. Now remember, secant is the reciprocal of cosine, so I need the r value and I need the x value. I'm not chasing the angle, I'm chasing the ratio. If I'm in quadrant number three and the tangent of alpha is defined as three over four, this tells me that my y value is three, my x value is four, but in quadrant number three, they're both negative. So x is equal to negative four and y is equal to negative three because I'm in quadrant four. Both the x and the y values are negative. So then I'm just chasing r. So r squared, or the square root, now remember, r is always going to be positive, so I don't have to worry about the plus and minus. This is going to be the negative 4 squared plus the negative 3 squared, which gives me the square root of 25, so in other words, 5. So my secant is my 5 over my x value, which is negative 4. So my answer is 5 over negative 4. Now, because of the relationship between the trigonometric function, sine, cosine, secant, cosecant, tangent, and cotangent, all we have to do if I'm chasing secant or cosecant is find the reciprocal of the appropriate sine or cosine angle. Tangent, what I'm going to do on the unit circle, is I'm just going to put my y value over my x or my x value over the y. So, what we have, because my radius is 1, we have still y over x. That doesn't change. Cotangent is still x over y. Still doesn't change. Notice, however, I do have to pay attention when my denominator is equal to 0. When my denominator is equal to 0, whether I'm talking about the tangent, secant, cosecant, or cotangent, if my denominator is equal to 0 at any of those points, then that means that that is undefined at that point. We don't have to worry about that on sine and cosine. But we do need to worry about that on tangent, secant, cosecant, and cotangent, which means it's going to change the domains. And we should talk about the ranges, too. We'll talk about that in a minute. So if I'm asked to find all the trigonometric functions on the unit circle, giving these ordered pairs on the unit circle, we know that the second part, or the y part, is my sine, so the sine of this angle t will be 1 half. The cosine of this angle t will be negative square root of 3 over 2. So then I have the cosecant of t, which is going to be the reciprocal of 1 half, which is 2 over 1, or just 2. The cosecant, uh, or the, excuse me, the secant of t, which is the reciprocal of the cosine, this is going to be negative 2 over the square root of 3. Now all I have to do is find the tangent. So the tangent of t. This will be my y value, which is 1 half, divided by my x value, which is negative square root of 3 over 2, which is the same thing as 1 half multiplied by the reciprocal of 2 over the square root of 3. So my answer is negative 1 over the square root of 3. Once I have the tangent, then the cotangent of t will be that reciprocal, which is negative square root of 3. So I found all six of those for that angle t. Similarly, if I am down in this quadrant, this again is my sine of my angle t, which is negative square root of 2 over 2, negative square root of 2 over 2. Here is my cosine of my angle t. This is square root of 2 over 2. Once I have sine and cosine, then I'm going to have the cosecant of t, which is the reciprocal of sine. So this is going to be negative uh, 2 over the square root of 2. And if I were to rationalize it, this is just the negative square root of 2. Cosine, its reciprocal is the secant of t. So this is going to be just the square root of 2. Now I just need to do my tangent of t. This is my y value, which is the negative square root of 2 over 2, divided by the square root of 2 over 2, which gives me negative 1, which means I now have the cotangent of t. Its reciprocal is also negative 1. So now I found all of my six trigonometric functions for those angles t. 
Once again, we're going to use reference angles like we did before to be able to find my exact values. And so it's always, again, off of my uh, the distance, shortest rotational distance to the x-axis. And that will be my reference angle. So as before, if this is pi over 6, this also has a reference angle of pi over 6. And so does this, and so does this, and the same thing for pi over 4 and pi over 3. So they're asking me to find, using the um, reference angle, they're asking me to find all six of my trigonometric functions. So my reference angle, if we remember it, we use like B prime. This is going to be, quadrant number two is where 150 lies, so it's going to be 180 degrees minus 150 degrees. So in other words, my reference angle is 30. So the sine of 150 degrees is the same thing as the sine of 30 degrees, which is going to be 1 half. Once I have the sine of 150 degrees, I automatically have the cosecant of 150 degrees, which will be equal to the cosecant of 30 degrees, which is equal to its reciprocal of 2. Let's do my cosine. The cosine of 150 degrees is the negative, because cosine is negative in quadrant number two, the cosine of 30 degrees. I can evaluate it with the 30 degrees, which is going to be negative square root of 3 over 2, which means once I have cosine, I have the secant of 150 degrees. And if cosine is negative in that quadrant, so will its reciprocal, which means this is negative 2 over the square root of 3. Now, once I have those, I can find my tangent. So the tangent of 150 degrees is going to be negative tangent, because tangent is negative in that quadrant, 30 degrees, which we know from up above the tangent of 30 degrees is going to be the y value, which was 1 half, divided by my x value, which was the negative square root of 3 over 2, which ends up giving me a negative 1 over the square root of 3. And if I choose to rationalize, I can write this as negative square root of 3 over 3. The cotangent of 150 degrees is going to be the negative cotangent of 30 degrees, which means that this is just going to be the reciprocal or negative square root of 3. So now I've found all three of them. Now I'm going to stop right here before I do anything else. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what I expect to happen in each one of my quadrants. In quadrant number one, I would expect all of my trig functions, if I land in quadrant number one, I expect all of my trig functions to be positive because both my x value and my y value are positive. In quadrant number two, I expect the sine and its reciprocal to be positive because the only thing that's positive in there is the y value. Down in quadrant number three, which is the tangent, is going to be positive because both the x value and the y value is negative. That means that as long as I have an x or a y as part of my ratio, it will be a negative value. So tangent and its, and its reciprocal will be positive in quadrant number three and only tangent and its reciprocal. Down in quadrant number four, because it's a positive x and a negative y, anything that has y attached to it as part of its ratio will be negative. So back in my old days, we would have said all students take chemistry. I know what you were thinking, but it's chemistry. So all of us took chemistry in the 80s, not that other thing that's illegal. So in the 80s, we all took chemistry. So all students take chemistry. All of them are positive in quadrant one. The sine and its reciprocal are positive in quadrant number two, tangent and its reciprocal in quadrant number three, and down in quadrant number four is going to be the cosine and its reciprocal. Now I also want to take a moment to talk about the domains and ranges of our new trigonometric functions. Now if we have the sine, the sine of our angle alpha, its domain, the domain of this is everything. I don't have any problems where x is any real number. And again, we're talking about the real number being 
that that relationship between the arc length being a real number and the angle remember we're on the unit circle now the reciprocal of sine is the uh, cosecant so the cosecant of alpha its domain is not going to be everything it's actually going to have problems in fact it's going to have problems whenever the sine is equal to zero so when i'm at pi multiples of pi i'm trying to divide by zero because it's the reciprocal so my domain for the cosecant is going to be all the x values so long as x um, is not uh, so how do i want to write this i'll do it like this so that x is not a multiple of pi where k is an integer and x is from the real numbers so that tells me that as long as i don't have a multiple of pi cosecant is totally fine let's talk about the range of sine well the range of sine again we know goes from negative one to one now notice i'm doing both one of the things i did with was with the uh, set builder now I'm using interval and you're thinking what what am I doing well it's just because I want you to get familiar with both so the range of this because this is a reciprocal of sine wherever I get close to a multiple of pi in other words wherever I get an output close to zero I'm doing the reciprocal of one over zero that tells me that it's actually going to get much larger or much smaller and if the smallest number that sine can take on is negative one and its largest number it can take on is positive one, then the reciprocals will be the opposite of that. So my range for cosecant is negative infinity to negative one, union between one to infinity. And we're gonna see that when we graph these. So in the next chapter, when we graph this, you're gonna think, oh, well, that makes sense. Now let's talk about the cosine. So we have the cosine of alpha its domain is like the domain of sine. It is x such that x is an element of the real numbers. The secant of alpha, its domain. Now this has a problem when we are straight up and straight down. So pi over two and three pi over two. So x, x cannot equal a multiple of pi over two k, where k is an, an integer and x is from the real numbers. So this eliminates the fact that I can't have pi over two, five pi over two, negative pi over two, negative seven pi over two, because if that's true, then I would be taking the reciprocal of zero, just like cosecant up that I just did. Its range for the cosine we know is from negative one to one, just like it is from sine. And the range of the secant is gonna be exactly the same as the range of the cosecant. So negative, negative infinity to negative one, union between one to infinity. Now let's talk about tangent and then we'll finish off these rest of these examples. So let's talk about tangent. Tangent of my angle. Now remember, this is my y value over my x value. So wherever my x is equal to zero, I have a problem, it's gonna be divided by zero. So its domain on this one is gonna be x such that x is not a multiple of pi over two. So not pi over two times k, k being an integer, x being a real number. The range on the tangent is actually everything because as long as x is not zero, I'm gonna get every single possible output value. So my range is negative infinity to infinity. Now let's talk about the cotangent, cotangent of alpha, which is equal to the y x value over the y value. The range is the easy part. It's also a negative infinity to infinity. Now the domain, because I'm now dividing by y, I'm gonna make sure that y isn't zero. Well, y happens to be zero at the zero and the pi and the two pi and the three pi. So it's gonna have the similar domain. It's kind of equal pi over k. k being an integer, 
x being x being an element of the real numbers, it's going to have a similar one as what we had for cosecant. Notice that cotangent and cosecant have similar values for our domains, and my tangent and my, cos and my secant have similar values for the domain, and that's because of where x or y is located as how we defined them. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about that so you have that as well for you in front of you. Now I'm going to go ahead and do one more, and I'm going to let C be yours. So I have 11 pi over 3. Now if you didn't watch the other video, the one previous to this, I will do this one again. So I have to figure out where 11 pi over 3 lands. So going to the negative rotation, this negative rotation, one full negative rotation, is 6 pi over 3, because that's 2 pi, so 6 pi over 3, which is still smaller, or still larger than that, so I'm not there yet. And I actually land right about, well, not drawn a scale, I land right there. If I'm not certain, what I can do is that I can add on 2 pi. When I added on 2 pi, I ended up with, when I added on 2 pi, I ended up with negative 5 pi over 3. So negative 5 pi over 3 lands me with a negative rotation. It lands me in quadrant number 1. I can also take and add on another multiple of 2 pi. This leaves me pi over 3. So this actually is a coterminal angle to negative pi, negative 11 pi over 3, but it's also my reference angle. We like that. So then the sine of 11 pi over 3 is the same thing as the sine of its coterminal, or in this case, it's also its reference angle, which is a negative square root of 3 over 2. Once I have sine, I have the cosecant of negative 11 pi over 3, which gives me the cosecant of pi over 3, which is just 2 over the square root of 3. The cosine of 11, negative 11 pi over 3, which is the cosine of pi over 3, which is 1 half. And I'm getting these all from my unit circle. Then the secant of a negative 11 pi over 3, which is equal to the secant of pi over 3, which is equal to the reciprocal, or 1 half, of reciprocal 1 half, which is 2. The tangent of negative 11 pi over 3, which is the tangent of pi over 3, which is my y value, the square root of 3 over 2, divided by 1 half, which gives me the square root of 3. And then the cotangent, last one, a negative 11 pi over 3, which is equal to the cotangent of pi thirds, which is equal to 1 over the square root of 3, because those are reciprocals. I'm going to let 7 pi over 4 be yours. So what happens when I'm not on the unit circle. Well, first of all, if you're in degrees, make sure you're in degrees. If you're in radians, make sure you're in radians. You don't want this to happen to you on the day of the testing. Oh, I answered everything, but was it in radians? Was it in degrees? So take a look on how to convert from degrees to radians on your calculator. If you're not sure, check it out. Um, do a search. YouTube has a whole bunch of videos on how to convert from radians to degrees for every calculator out there. So go take a look, make sure you know how to convert from one to the other. Now, 7 pi over 5 is not on my, um, it's not on my unit circle. So how do I evaluate this? How do I evaluate anything not on the unit circle? And how do I evaluate cosecant? Well, cosecant is 1 over the sine of 7 pi over 3. So what I do is I make sure my calculator is in radians first and foremost. So I'm going to go out to my calculator, which you can't see, unfortunately. We'll do this in class if you need us to do that in class. I'm going to go out and hit my mode. I'm in radians, so I'm good. So I'm going to do the sign in my calculator. I'm going to do exactly that. I'm going to do the reciprocal if I have the reciprocal button. So I'm going to do the reciprocal button, or I'm going to just do 1 divided by. And I'm going to put in sign in my calculator. I'm going to do 7 times my pi. I have a pi button. 
and then I'm going to divide it by 3 and close my parentheses. So what I did put in my calculator is I put 1 divided by the sign. I have a pi button, so I did 7 pi divided by 3. And that's exactly how I put it in my calculator. And my answer that kicks out is 1.1547. And then I have some zeros trailing, but that's four decimal places, so that's way sufficient. So that is how I'd put that in my calculator. I'd actually do the reciprocal of the, I'd evaluate it as the sine of 7 pi over 3, and then just do the reciprocal of that answer. Now here's some of our fundamental identities. So we talked about these. We defined tangent as sine over cosine. Secant is 1 over cosine. Cosecant is 1 over sine. And cotangent is 1 over the tangent. We took our Pythagorean identity and we get these are equivalent in Pythagorean identities. And you're like, how did that happen? Now if you remember, the cosine squared of t plus the sine squared of t is equal to 1 all day long. If I divide every term by the sine squared of t, I'm going to get this one. If I take and divide everything by, instead of sine squared, if I did divide each term by the cosine squared of t, so I'm going to divide by the cosine squared of t each term, I get this one. So these are equivalent to the one that we learned in our last videos. Lastly, we're going to talk about odd and even functions. Now, if you remember from pre-calculus 1, we defined an even function. If I put in a negative value into my function, and I got the exact same thing as if I would have put in a positive value into my function, then we say that their graph has symmetry with respect to the y-axis, and we say it's even. If we put in a negative number into our function and the exact opposite came out as if I would have put the positive of that number into that function, then we say that we have symmetry with respect to the origin and we say it's odd. Trigonometric functions are either even or odd. And we can test this by testing a positive or negative angle. So if I put in pi over 3. Actually, that looks more like pi over 6. So if I put in pi over 6, and then I put in negative pi over 6, if I get the exact same answer out, then I have an even function. If I get the exact same answer out with opposite signs, that means I have an odd function. Now remember, all of them are positive here, and only the cosine is positive here. So I don't have to do any work. I know if I put in pi over 6 or negative pi over 6, my cosine will be the same value. So that tells me that the cosine of my angle t and its reciprocal, which is the secant of t, are even. And I also know if I try to do this with all the rest of them, it's not going to work out. I'll actually get the negative value of those. So I know from just looking at the graph and knowing that I'm in quadrant 1 and 4, then the sine of t and its reciprocal, which is the cosecant of t, are odd. The same thing is true of the tangent of t and the cotangent of t. So the only ones that are even are the secant and the cosine. It's the only ones that are even. And that's because if I put in the angle and then the negative rotation, whether I'm in quadrant 1 and 4 or quadrant 2 and 3, the only time I'm going to get the exact same value out when I put in a negative, negative angle rotation is for cosine and secant. All the rest of them are going to give me the negative of that answer. So that gives me odd and even. So if I was asked to determine whether these functions are odd, even, or neither, I'd have to look to see what I have. So I'm going to put in a negative angle. So f of negative x is equal to the cosine of negative 2x. The 2 is not going to do anything. Now, I know that cosine is even. So the cosine of negative 2x is the same thing as the cosine of 2x because that's how I defined cosine being an even function. So this is even. Let's 
take a look at the second one. So I have f of negative x. This is equal to 2 the sine of negative x times the cosine of negative x. Now, I happen to know that this is just going to be the same thing as the cosine of x. But this, because sine is odd, is going to be negative sine of x. So when I get done, it's going to be negative 2, the sine of x, the cosine of x. And this is actually odd because I put in a negative value and the exact opposite came out. So this is odd. Let's look at cosecant. So I do f of negative alpha. That was an awful, awful alpha. Which is 1 plus the cosecant of negative alpha. Now, cosecant is the reciprocal of sine. So this is equal to 1 minus the cosecant of alpha because sine is odd. Because I ended up with an answer that is not exactly what I started out with, nor is all the signs changed, so this one is neither. So that answer is neither. Now let's take a look at my last example here. So I'm going to put in negative beta. So f of negative beta is equal to negative beta, the cosine of negative beta. I'm just going to erase this so I can get myself some space here. When I do this, I'm going to get a negative beta, but we know that this cosine of negative beta is just the cosine of beta. So this is just the cosine of beta. So I put in a negative beta, and the exact opposite kicked out, as if I would have put in a positive one. So this one, again, is odd. So that's odd and even. We're going to use all of this information to start doing trig identities. Now, this learning outcome is not about trig identities, but we are building out to a learning outcome that is trig identities. So if we're asked to just simplify it, so we're going to start the foundational work for the learning outcome for trig identities. If we're asked to simplify this, I'm going to deal with the sine of negative x. Sine is odd, so this is equivalent to the negative sine of x. Cotangent is also odd, so this is negative cotangent x. So this is going to simplify it into a negative 1 times the sine, a negative 1 times the cotangent, the sine x, the cotangent x. So this is just going to be the sine of x, the cotangent of x. And that's it. I'm going to do the same thing here as I'm going to approach each piece individually. Now I'm going to deal with the negative angles first. So I'm going to do the cotangent of negative x. It's going to be the negative cotangent of x because cotangent being odd. So this is equal to the tangent of the third minus the secant squared of the tangent x. Don't drop my angle like I did there. Over the negative cotangent of x. Now, what I have is I have that one fundamental identity. If you remember, it was 1 plus the tangent squared of x is equal to because I'm dividing everything by cosine, that means this must be equal to the secant squared of x. So this is a fundamental identity that, or the Pythagorean identity, excuse me, the Pythagorean identity that we have. I'm going to try to use that here. What I see is a tangent cubed and a secant squared, but I also have this tangent multiplied by the secant. So if I factor out of the numerator a tangent x, then I'm going to be left with a tangent squared of x minus the secant squared of x over the negative cotangent of x. Now I got the tangent squared out of the secant squared. So I'm going to take this Pythagorean identity and I'm going to subtract secant squared from both sides and then I'm going to subtract 1 from both sides. So I'm going to get the tangent squared of x minus the secant squared of x is equal to negative 1. That tells me that this factor can be replaced with negative 1. So then this is equal to the tangent of x multiplied by a negative 1 divided by a negative 1, the cotangent of x. Notice how this negative 1 and this negative 1 will cancel. So then I'm just left with the tangent of x over the cotangent of x. However, the cotangent of x is the same thing as 1 over the, the tangent of x. So this is equal to 
the tangent of x divided by 1 over the tangent of x, which is equal to the tangent of x, and then my denominator, I'm going to multiply by the reciprocal of my denominator, which is the tangent of x over 1. My final answer is tangent squared of x. And that's what that simplifies to. We're going to have plenty of practice to do these identities. I would highly recommend that you start doing the ones in the book now per section rather than skipping over them. Even if it's not on the homework, I would highly recommend you start looking at the ones in the textbook so that when you get to that learning objective, you have practiced some of the, quote, simpler ones and you won't be like, holy smokes, what's going on here? That's it for this video. We will see you in class and see my next video, 5.4. And then we're into chapter six.